Um, this is my fourth Red Monk uh, event, and I realized in preparing this that I've never actually been in the front half of the room. I always seem to be with the, the people writing code at the back, and it's, it's very good to be surrounded by um, technologists, and particularly people like Yoda and Abby, who bring a different real-world experience to this. From my side, I've been in security for about 15 years now. Uh, the first decade in national security, and more recently being in enterprise security. And I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time, and found a, or co-founded, uh, an alliance called the Trusted IoT Alliance, which is some of the, um, the things that I'll be talking about here. But I would particularly like to shout out to Finton and say thank you very much for allowing me to present after beer has been served, because I think a sizable proportion of, of the audience is going to be saying, pass me another beer, I'm going to need it. Because this is going to go one of two ways from your perspective. I'm either going to stand at the front and try and persuade you that blockchain is going to solve all of your problems, it's going to do your laundry, it's going to do your dishes. Or I could actually look at this in a, a slightly more pragmatic way. Because we all know that blockchain is massively hyped. Uh, a different analyst firm to Redmonk has helpfully reminded us of this and put blockchain at the peak of ex inflated expectations. And when I was preparing this, I, I kind of thought to myself, well, one of the advantages of ThingMonk is that it's all about looking to the future. So how about we try and talk about blockchain as though it's actually down in the trough of disillusionment and there isn't any hype about it? And that's what I'm going to do for, uh, or try and do for the next 30 minutes. Now, in terms of the conversation um, at ThingMonk events, one of the things I've found is that it is, it seems to crystallize ideas. And it's, it's one of the ideas that I, I've returned to again and again over the last 12 months from last year is something that Stacy Higginbotham or Giga Stacy said, and it's about the fact that the Internet of Things isn't about the things. It's about the data. It's about the services. It's about the value that you put on top of it. And for me, one of the biggest problems I have with blockchain conversations is that they start with, the solution is blockchain. Sorry, what was the question? What was the problem? And really what we need to do is actually step back and go, what is a problem? Why would blockchain make sense? How could it actually be used? And Yoda made a, a very interesting quip earlier when she, the, the comment was about uh, the number of customers that she had and the fact that we're paying customers and the fact that IoT is maturing from just endless POCs to people actually paying for, for this. And it leads from Stacy's quote to thinking about IoT business models. And kind of the, the core themes that certainly I take away whenever I come to IoT conferences, it's around sharing economy and providing access to, or access to underutilized um, assets, be it your house, be it your car, and so on and so forth. But then there's also a side of it where it's about delegating tasks to machines. If you think about when you ask Alexa to order something from Amazon, it's about asking a machine to do a transaction on your behalf. And similarly, when we, we talk about supply chains, there's clear benefit that sensors, be it temperature sensors in chemo drugs um, or shipping sensors for um, location, where's that package gone, and so on and so forth, are key things to, that are, are really beneficial here. But from this, the, there's two parts, uh, or two 
underlying implicit assumptions that aren't really often talked about. When you think about Alexa using your credit card to buy things, a machine-to-machine -machine transaction, there is implicit trust there. Money is, being, is exchanging hands. Money is moving between two different um, parties. If you're giving access to your home or your car or other sharing things, there is this element of trust that has to be built in and baked in to, to the Internet of Things. And when you think about supply chain, you can turn around and it started off in a good state and the, the next time that you actually find out whether it's worked and it's stayed within temperature is often right at the very end. And there's this trust element that everyone did their job or did their part effectively. And the second thing which is critically important um, is the fact that IoT is an inherently a distributed landscape. Now as a, a fast forward to when I eventually start talking about blockchain, one of the things that I, that's critical is blockchain is a solution to a distributed problem. If you don't have a distributed problem, blockchain will never be the answer. So when we actually look at I, IoT, what are some of the questions or what are the reasons why you might start thinking about using blockchain? And one of them is how do I work with someone that I don't fully trust? It's an age-old problem, but it's a problem that machines and devices are, are going to have to solve. How does a device know that it's not a malicious attacker that's just trying to steal your credit card? or take funds out of Amazon. And to be very clear, we solve this problem today. But the way that we solve it is very much around a client server and a hierarchical model. If these devices want to know whether they trust each other, they're going to have to call back to a central trust authority, a demigod, that says, you are allowed to talk to that person, but you're not allowed to talk to that person. And in all the conferences and all the, uh, the times I've come to ThingMonk, there's been this running dialogue just generally within IoT, the fact that client-server relationships are dead. It's about distributed systems. It's about that's how you unlock the ability to scale. So if that's a problem, maybe a distributed trust model might actually be something that's useful uh, as we go forward. And blockchain may be able to help with that. So the second thing, how many people have heard of the dolphin attack that was published last week? One or two, okay, cool. So um, there is a running joke at every single security conference that IoT is horribly insecure. And the latest example of that um, is a dolphin attack which came out of China. And what the short version of it is if you frequency shift a human voice to above 20 kilohertz, it turns out that Humans can't hear it because our ears can't hear that high, but Siri and Alexa and other voice IoT devices can hear it, and hence you can um, work out or start. An attacker can turn around and play some sounds at your Alexa device and start ordering things on your behalf. Now, that's just the latest attack. And it's not to, to turn around and do the fear, uncertainty, and doubt aspect to it. Because attacks are going to happen. About two months ago, I was um, talking to uh, the chairman of the uh, GSM Standards Agency. 
And the way he explained it is the fact that there have been about 90 or 100 different attacks against the GSM protocol. And they spent hours on trying to secure it. And not a single one of the attacks that actually presented itself in the wild they had thought about during the writing process. So this idea that you can actually think up and prevent an attack, it, it's, it's just not reality. At the end of the day, ask Equifax about their firewalls. I'm sure they're fantastic and they're preventing lots of port scans but that doesn't help Abby's social security number. So the model that's actually used and, and the way that security works is actually to say, okay, attacks are going to happen. Let's assume they're, hap they're going to happen. So the question is, how do we detect them and how do we recover from them? And that actually comes into some key attributes of systems that are, that are really useful. And that is understanding what has happened. And that when you boil it down, it's about making sure you have a log file. I often think that when talking about this stuff, it's very much the same as debugging. Do you have a, doc, a log file? Who did what when? What process did what when? And is the data in the log file what actually happened. As developers, these are common things that you're going to be asked. But as soon as you apply them to a blockchain, uh, to a uh, distributed environment, it becomes that much more complicated, that much uh, of a bigger question. So having spent 10 minutes and barely talked about blockchain, I think it's probably worth defining it and actually getting down into some examples of how it can help with these particular problems that I, I've mentioned. So, what is blockchain? Alistair helpfully um, <laughs> provided a slightly broken Merkle tree uh, last, last year. Um, for me, it has, a, it has a place in my heart, this definition. But I don't think it's actually something that is useful to, to carry on the conversation about um, how, how we can actually solve some of the challenges that we've put forward. So the blockchain, uh, sorry, the definition of blockchain that I use is a mutually distributed ledger. And it's a very loose definition by design. What I mean by that is mutually, there isn't a leader, there isn't a hierarchy, everyone is equal within the network. Distributed, the information, everyone has it in the network. And ledger, think accounting ledger. There's certain rules in the way that it works. You can't simply just delete data. If you make an error, you have to back it off by doing a, a reversal and then putting the correct answer in. All very simple. So why such a loose definition? One reason is because when I was a developer, I learnt and loved Perl, and that's potentially one of the loosest languages. But for me, I don't think it matters, the actual implementation details of, of what happens. I'm tangentially involved with some of the ISO standards on trying to define what blockchain is. And best of luck to them, because I can tell you, the community doesn't know what blockchain is. Is it like Ethereum and a partially connected graph like this? Or is it like IOTA and a, a, a directed acyclic graph? Which one of those is a blockchain? In my definition, both are, because it's about the properties and, and the, the value that you can actually get out of, of this technology. The other thing that really, really annoys me about blockchain conversations is people blow it out of all proportion. To be really clear, 
blockchain should be a hidden infrastructure. And it should be really boring. It should be no more interesting than the fact that you're using a database, a relational database. And because of all the hype and hoopla that's happened around it at the moment, it's elevated to well beyond the place where it should be. Because in an IoT environment, you have your devices, you have your data and your service, and all blockchain is there to do is actually help with that trust, ensuring the data that's coming from your devices is actually hitting your application and service in the right way. Now, I just want to briefly touch on some of the characteristics of blockchain. And I variously quote that there's about 500 different types of blockchain environment. But they all boil down into certain things that you, you can kind of use to assess whether something or how things fit together. I think of it as a two by two matrix and on the X axis, so to speak, there's a choice of whether the blockchain data, the data that's actually recorded on it, is it public or is it private? The ones that people uh, will have heard of, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and so on and so forth, they are public blockchains. But there are an equal number of private blockchains where companies, organizations, or um, networks within people's houses can actually store that data and keep it local. And then the second part of it on the, on the y-axis is how do you get access to that network? Is it a free-for-all? Can anyone get access? Is it an unpermissioned blockchain? Again, the likes of Ethereum and Bitcoin, anyone can join. But if you're thinking about corporates and enterprise and IoT environments, it makes a lot more sense to have it constrained so you control what devices are on your network. And that's where we're actually, from, from what I'm seeing and uh, my work on a daily basis, I'm seeing a lot more private permissioned blockchains being used in IoT and enterprise environments. Because at the end of the day, the data is valuable and it can be used for monetized services and the like. Now, one of the sticky areas of, um, of blockchain, and, and to be fair, all distributed systems, is how do you deal with faults? How do you deal with attacks? How many people have heard of the Byzantine generals problem? Everyone, well, almost everyone. Um, for, for people who haven't, um, people who are uh, new to the community, what it effectively talks about is how do two nodes communicate with each other and synchronize each other to do something when you can't trust the network and you can't trust that the communications are going to get through. And that was um, first defined in about 1982. And there's been various solutions Paxos is certainly um, one that's very familiar. But when we get to about 2008, Nakamoto consensus is probably the first example of where you can actually start working on solving the Byzantine generals problem at a large internet scale. And from there, it just starts exploding and you've got, this is a very much a simplified graph of all the different types. There's many, many more different solutions to that problem that have been published recently. And I would recommend going to um, Zaki Mannion's uh, GitHub where he's got a great presentation that walks you through how you actually consider uh, and look at different, um, look at different solutions to this problem and look at the, uh, the relative um, benefits of one over the other. Because there are so many coming out, it's, it's becoming hard to actually work out which is the best to use. To be clear, um, 
this one, the Nakamoto consensus, because it is based on a permissionless or unpermissioned uh, public blockchain, that's the one that uses proof of work. That's the reason why is it the um, electricity consumption of Denmark is used globally to crunch and hash some numbers to work out whether um, people agree on, on details within the, block, uh, within the Bitcoin network. That makes no sense for IoT because the first thing it's going to do is run out your battery. So, one of the things coming from a, a security background is that I look at things in terms of security primitives. What is the fundamentals of, of a particular a system? And security um, has five principles. It's about confidentiality, integrity, availability, accountability, and auditability. Over all the different types of security system you have, those are the five things that ultimately you, you're trying to solve. And when you apply that into um, a blockchain environment, what you find is that because the data is written to many, many locations, you always have the availability of that data. If we're thinking about the most common uses of, uh, of blockchain in IoT environments, it's permissioned, and so therefore you have, you know exactly who's connected to that network. And because of the foundation, the fundamental way of blockchain working, having those chain of things, or a chain of um, data in um, an Ethereum network or in a um, IOTA tangle, you have that strong integrity that you know A happened before B happened before C, and so on and so forth. And so these are also the, um, the features that I was talking about right at the start when I was talking about how do you detect attacks in networks. And it's one of those things where governance and the way that you actually work with um, oversight within these networks actually becomes an analytics problem because all the data is flowing past you. It's just for you to, to look at the patterns that come out of it. So if that's a foundation layer, then there's one more subject that I, I want to talk about with regard to, to blockchain technology. And that is the fact that rather than just recording raw data, rather than recording just temperatures or uh, GPS locations onto a, a distributed ledger, what happens if, you, if that data was code? and that software could be run at each location. It means that the entire network can form consensus on whether a particular function should execute. And it means that you no longer have to have these hierarchies where you, you go into a hub or a gateway and all the brains happens in there, but the way things operate and the way things work actually sit on the network in what's called a smart contract. Now thinking about um, the example I was, I was talking about in terms of payments, machine to machine payments, one of the questions that the IoT community is, is going to come up against in a few years time is what is the legal right of this machine talking to this machine has a contract been formed between them? Because at the end of the day, if money's been exchanged, these questions uh, are starting to, going to need to be answered. Now, the good thing is the blockchain people are already ahead of you. And they are working with various regulators around the world and legislators to make sure that you can have a legally binding agreement between two devices between two machines. And, and I think this is one of those areas where this is actually going to help IoT people when 
it becomes more relevant to, to making those kind of machine uh, machine to machine payments and, and trusted interactions. So I just want to round out with talking about the Trusted IoT Alliance briefly. And one of the, the great things about this particular group of companies is the fact that it's a very pragmatic conversation. At the end of the day, if you have two very highly hyped things to talk about, you, you have a question, is it going to come together and you're just going to get a foam party of froth and, and, and hype, or is it going to be constructive or, sorry, destructive interference, cancel out and actually have a pragmatic conversation? It turns out, luckily enough, that it is a very pragmatic conversation, and Anup Nanra from Cisco, who, who's um, one of the chairs of the, of the Trusted IoT, chairman of the board for the Trusted IoT Alliance, he opened the, um, the members meeting in May by saying, we are on the first page of the first chapter of blockchain. This is very, very early. And to be frank, Cisco is going to need at least another six, seven, or eight generations of blockchain before it's actually going to be useful for what we, what we need it for. Now, to be fair, when Anoop says that, he's talking about having hundreds of millions of devices connected and being able to automate the trust between them. In, in terms of the people involved, the founding members, what's really nice is that you've got a very strong split between the large established companies and then the startup. And much like the, the view of blockchain being uh, a mutual, balanced conversation, that's exactly the same way as this actually works in, in practice. So, what is this all about? This is all about building an industry, ultimately. It is about publishing open source and making things available so people can get the benefits of blockchain within a, a, an IoT environment. And much like Cloud Foundry, we have the open source um, software there. And it is based on those smart contracts that I talked about previously. And it's about connecting um, Let me just give you some examples of, of real-world use cases that, that people are actually using it for. The first one is about connecting luxury goods. One of the, um, Bitsy is a member of the Alliance, and in China, the user need is to actually prove the authenticity of high-end bags, high-end um, goods and services. So what they are doing is they're putting tags, NFC tags, in here, which provide a crypto identity for this that can then be put onto the internet. Similarly, from Chronicled, based out of San Francisco, they're taking it one stage further and putting it as a security seal that you can wrap over the top of medical devices and that provide you with assurance that those medical devices haven't been uh, tampered with. And if uh, the, the security seal has been broken, then um, at the moment you, you get a failure on the NFC, but they're working on the ability to have a bit flip that will then highlight that that has been changed. Why is that important? Think about supply chain. Um, Johnson & Johnson CEO stood up at South by Southwest and turned around and said, I want assurance that when we manufacture a prosthetic or when we manufacture a medical device, it goes through our entire supply chain and at the hospital, I want confidence that that medical device is actually 
came from um, Johnson & Johnson and there hasn't been any issues. Now, currently, there isn't a good solution to that. It's spot audits, it's human intervention. But if you think about putting these kind of crypto seals onto it, you have the benefit where um, as the device gets passed between different parties, there isn't a central point that you have to trust. Everyone has an equal stake in getting it. And that's the kind of thing and the kind of business value that is uh, coming from blockchain in an IoT context. I've got a few more examples, but in the interest of time, uh, if there's any questions. <laughs>